Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Agatha Walker and I'm the Marketing Manager at InVMA. I'm here to introduce you to our keynote speakers. We have John Hill, Chief Operating Officer at InVMA. John worked as an Executive Consultant, Program Manager and Engineer. He has a successful history of developing innovative business strategies and delivering large-scale IT-enabled change. John is an expert of, of using live data from connected devices to improve client profitability. Our second speaker is Matt Walter, a senior co controls engineer who has been with Cooper Vision for over six years. During this time, he has worked largely on the development and expansion of the of the made-to-order process, a highly connected manufacturing platform which uses IoT and big data to provide Cooper Vision's customers with batch size of one orders from an unprecedented range of SKUs. Mark works as a part of the European technical team responsible for development and delivery of next generation manufacturing technology to enable Cooper Vision's goal of becoming world's number one. Matt and John will be happy to answer your questions. So I would like to encourage you to type your questions into the question box in your control panel. They will answer them at the end of the session. It's over to you, John. Hello, and welcome to InVMA's Hidden Factory webinar series. My name is John Hill. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of InVMA. And before I introduce you to our guest speaker today, I'd like to just explain to you a little bit about InVMA and who we are, the background to the webinar series, and also what you can expect to get value from the series as you look through and probably look at the other webinars that we have on offer. So first of all about InVMA. Our purpose is to connect the physical and digital worlds to transform industry. And we do this by using technology, solving problems, and driving change. What makes us unique is that we have a deep sector expertise and track record in the industrial market. We have an end-to-end -end industrial transformation capability from strategy consultancy through to control systems integration. We have an extensive ecosystem of partners they include PTC with their ThingWorks and Vuforia Studio, Microsoft Azure, ARM for connectivity, Dell for gateways and hardware, and we also have our service partners of DMS and Sensei. The other thing that makes us unique is our flexible products and services. We have our AssetMinder product, which enables you to rapidly get to value in your digital transformation or smart factory implementation. And our services range from a simple discovery workshop to expose you to the new technologies that may impact your business, through to a strategy workshop with your senior leadership team to identify where the best bets are to place with the new digital technologies, a design and implementation workshop, which looks at how and what's the best ways of implementing in your specific situation, followed by our more traditional application development and system integration services. And of course, once you have done the implementation, our support package and service level agreements to help maintain the savings and investments that you've made. Why did we decide on raising and starting this webinar series? Well, bluntly, it's because digital transformation is happening now. A recent study by PwC showed that 90% of industrial companies are investing in digital factories. 70% of companies consider digital manufacturing at the top of their operation strategy agenda, according to McKinsey. And indeed, in the United States, the Association of the National Association of Manufacturers have made the statement that industrial companies need to capitalize on digital technologies to defend and advance their competitive advantage. Indeed, the World Economic Forum have found that those companies, the lighthouse implementations, as they call them, yield a huge impact. And they've reported double digit KPI improvement in areas from factory output increase to productivity, to OEE, to product cost, time to market reduction. And indeed, the Standard & Poor's have noted that failure to act and make digital implementations over the next 10 years, half of the people in the Standard & Poor's 500 firms will be displaced. Most companies fail to move to this stage of scale and capture value at scale. And in, 
And McKinsey in 2018 identified that in large factories, there were up to eight digital transformation related pilots running in each one of those factories. But only but only 25 percent of those succeeded. 75 percent of those failed to go on to deliver any continuing value. And that's why we set up the webinar series. What we're trying to do is through our demonstrations of maybe the technology and our approaches, but more importantly, presentations from our partners and our customers who are going through this process or have delivered on these processes right now, will prove valuable to our other potential customers and current customers. So why did we choose the title, Exposing the Hidden Factory and Unleashing the Smart Factory? Well, there are four big disruptive technologies that are driving what the Germans call Industry 4.0 and what we call smart manufacturing in the UK. And they are industry IoT and analytics. This is where technologies that drive information technology and operational technology convergence across the value chain. And it's really aimed at increasing automation and productivity, taking advantage of new sensor technologies, industrial innovation platforms, as well as the reducing cost of processing power. The second is augmented reality, using and projecting digital information over the physical world in context. This reduces things like training costs, improves quality, and makes labor 15 to 50% more efficient based on real life use cases. And those use cases are normally around training, as we said, but also support and remote service. Additive manufacturing is radically transforming engineering, manufacturing and supply chain processes. And similarly, digital innovation platforms are in CAD, PLM, but also analytics and manufacturing uh, simulation tools are significantly reducing the cost of developing innovative approaches to production. Today, though, we're going to focus on the industrial IoT and analytics disruptive technology. So the objective of the next part of this short presentation is really to understand what is the hidden factory? Why do we talk about it? What problems and opportunity can Industry 4 help us solve the move to smart factory? How do we solve them when, frankly, one size doesn't fit all? And where should you start? So first of all, what is the hidden factory? The hidden factory is defined around Six Sigma and similar initiatives where they focus on identifying the hidden factory, which is the activities that reduce the quality or efficiency of a manufacturing operation or business process, but are not initially known to managers and others seeking to improve the process. It's the stuff that's hidden. It's the stuff that doesn't happen. Unnecessary rework, changeovers, the kind of things that really should be measured and understood that aren't. So if you look overall, the opportunities that are there are around overall equipment effectiveness, normal availability, performance and quality, compliance, utility management, supply chain status, and material availability, all about improving the flow of information through the factory and the flow of product as it moves through the factory. But that's from the internal perspective. From the external perspective as well, it's also about the flow of data, social, economic, and environmental, to help with forecasting and, and prediction of uh, demand from supplier information and supply chain to understand where stock is in supply bases and supply chain so that ordering can be done more effectively. And similarly, flowing through the process, having those same relationships with the end customer of the factories. The other way as well is, is managing or capturing best practice, performance, reliability of your vendors and therefore doing vendor analysis. But we're going to focus inside the factory and really start to think about What's going on now? If we think in the factory at the moment, in a lot of cases, data is across many different types of applications, from whether it's at the control layer, people have different, sometimes PLCs, different levels of control. And indeed, um, factories can resemble the life cycle of the different technologies over the ages. And then over the top of that, we start to see manufacturing uh, resource planning software, uh, CFM, uh, CAFM software like Maximo, et cetera, and analytic software like Tableau. And overall, these different uh, softwares uh, work in a lot of cases independently or a lot of bespoke configuration 
and uh, customization has been required to put them together. So consequently, a lot of the places that we go to and look at, these two products are used extensively to bring the information together to present to management. And what's driving this problem is the architecture and the ISA 95 model. Very useful to look at this in the levels of the different layers of uh, IT infrastructure that have been put in place, starting from level one or zero around the control level and data acquisition at the PLC, CNC or workstation level, going up to the SCADA, the level two, HMI, test stands, et cetera, throwing to operational control, manufacturing systems, up to the business systems, ERP, CAD, PLM. And the problem that we have is that <clears throat> the people that use those models <clears throat> go through the different areas of look at production, quality, inventory, maintenance, energy. They're all looking across all those different levels of the, of the ISA 95 model and don't get transparency across them. And so now with industrial innovation platforms related to Industry 4.0, such as ThingWorks, you can start to provide a unified visibility across systems. You can wrap and extend existing systems and you can start to do rapid application development. So you can start to produce and provide applications to your individual users in the factory environment where you're providing them with the data that they need to change the way they work. And you're also providing with the ability to interact with those systems in one pane of glass. A few business cases that <clears throat> start to come around that are in condition-based maintenance and predictive maintenance by using the data from the machines to connect to and start to drive with the CAFM systems the, uh, the um, assignment of people to do work. You can start to capture and do quality inventory and, and audit management using low cost, in this case, a handheld uh, barcode scanner, but they also can use RFID te technology, beacon technology. There's plenty of other different technologies to do that. You can also then start to increase the uh, relationship that you have with your partners, like one of our customers, Howden, is with their uh, uh, customers in the field. Howden Process Compressors, they use a um, their uptime platform to enable to talk to their customers about energy optimization and provide additional maintenance services. And then obviously with third-party logistics companies starting to provide cross-channel visibility into inventories. So all of these are just these are just a few use cases, but really the key issue is that one size doesn't fit all. So where do you start? Now obviously there are different pictures of different factories here, from food and bev through to automotive through to um, uh, uh, FMCG. But it's not just about the process and asset changes; it's also about these other elements as we see them. So first of all, the strategy that a company's got and the market that it's based upon based in will make a significant difference to what is important to that customer in terms of where they should focus the digital investment. In addition, strategic alignment, i.e. how aligned are the management team around the initiatives that you're proposing, the cultural alignment in that a lot of the digital strategies require very transparent sharing of data and information about performance across a workplace. And that might not be culturally aligned with the, uh, the type of performance management processes you've got in place. The organization structure, even down to who owns IT and who owns OT in an organization, can be a consideration about where you start. And then when you look into the process area, you're looking at supply chain, the production, the management processes, and indeed the continuous improvement processes for where you need to make your investment. And it's only then, once you've gone through all those considerations, that you start to consider the technology that's engaged from your range of assets that you've got to connect to, your data maturity and how you collect, collect data, whether you're run, uh, using historians, for example, the network and network infrastructure and the type of enterprise systems that you've got. So that's why one size doesn't fit all. And we propose that when you're unlocking the opportunities, you start here at the strategy level and then you work around people, process and then technology. And by following that, you'll focus on what is the key value for the organization? Where do you see the key opportunities? You can then pilot and test it in the process, knowing that with the alignment from the strategy of the people with what you're testing, you'll be then able to roll out and scale at a later date. And this is the key point is that 
we found that by putting in the technology and putting in a, a very flexible technology, you will find that as you expose your hidden factory, your priorities will change as you start to get an understanding of the reality and the truth that faces you. So what we say is in terms of project delivery, IT comes to OT, the agile delivery method starts to get involved in the areas which were traditionally in the waterfall. And what we propose is that people hold design and prioritization sessions to explore detailed requirements as the new reality is exposed to them about the performance of the plant. And that agile method means that you, you build up new ideas and new stories of how you want to see improvements. You go through a planning stage to really get make sure you're making the right investments. You do a design and product backlog stage. You go out to different marketplaces on these industrial platforms like ThingWorks and pull out different applications. And then you deploy them and go through a series of executed approved sprints. When you get to the end of that, that sprint, you take stock, you go back to your prioritize list, and then you decide if there's something new that you'd like to prioritize, uh, start to get you to value. So what I wanted to do was answer these questions. What is the hidden factory? And I hopefully explain that. What problems and opportunities can Industry 4 help you solve? How do we solve them? And where would you start? Thank you, John. And uh, just to let you know, if you missed anything from John's presentation, uh, a link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to you after the session. Uh, it's over to you, Matt. Hi there, my name is Matt Walter. I'm a senior controls engineer from CooperVision. Um, and I'd like to talk to you today about exposing the hidden factory and give you a little insight into our vision and our journey of how we as a company have embraced and utilized Industry 4.0. So, Coopervision, who are we? We are essentially we're the number two contact lens manufacturer in the world. Um, we have close to, well, we manufacture close to three billion lenses every year. Uh, three quarters of a billion of which are made right here in the UK. Uh, we turn over more than two billion dollars, and we have manufacturing facilities uh, throughout Europe and the US, uh, both North and South America. Um, we've got over ten thousand employees worldwide. And we've got by far and away the largest portfolio of lenses of any of the lens manufacturers. So in terms of uh, Industry 4, why? Why have, why have we chosen to invest? So essentially, this, uh, this summary was given to me by one of the NVMA directors, and I think it sums it up quite nicely. Essentially, we've got two options. We're either trying to gain more output from the same input. In other words, by doing nothing with our inputs, can we get more from it? or I want to gain the same amount of output, but by using less input. So uh, I think in very high level simplistic terms, that summarizes why we're looking to invest. But in addition to that, uh, we as a company have a history of um, establishing ourselves as a market leader with the adaptation and the usage of technology. Um, we're often pushing the, the, uh, the thresholds and the capabilities of modern manufacturing technology to produce uh, lenses or products that have never been developed or never been seen before. So um, as a result of that, many of our company methods already employ vision before uh, capabilities and methodologies. So in many ways, we were sort of prepared and ready for industry four. We were just looking for that, uh, that mechanism or that process to bring them all together. Uh, as a manufacturer, we suffer all the same challenges as any other manufacturer. So we're constantly looking to improve yield and throughput maintain our quality, reduce costs, et cetera. Um, we're also a very high volume manufacturer. So we have a large number of lines, uh, each of which is producing nearly 20,000 lenses every hour. So even a fraction of 1% increase uh, equates to an awful lot of extra product. So there's some real benefits to be, um, to be achieved via the uh, implementation and usage of industry four. But also our company values. We are a very inventive company. Often we go to the market, we can't find a solution, so we invent it ourselves. Um, we're dedicated to being uh, you know, one of the best in the world. So the values of the company very much embrace the industry fourth floor. So CooperVision had to develop a strategy of how we were going to embark on this industry four journey. Um, and we broke it down into a number of different pr uh, processes, technologies, or philosophies. Um, 
we've it starts off at very low level of introducing maybe a few smart sensors or connecting to a few more devices all the way up to a full iot strategy which using ai and machine learning um, and a fully connected enterprise not only at plant level but also globally um, as there's a as a real global ambition the um the the, the roadmap that's, that's been put put forward uh, is estimated to be about a five or six year plan. So it's, it's a very large, long term journey. But the scale of, of the uh, deployment is potentially going to be one on a global scale across multiple different continents and manufacturing platforms. So how did we start our journey? Well, as with any new technology, um, we had to do an awful lot of research. So we attended lots of trade expos. We visited uh, conferences. We spoke to all of our major automation suppliers and our IT infrastructure teams to understand what technology was out there, what uh, was on offer, but also what did we want to um, achieve. We uh, invited many of our suppliers to provide samples or come and give us demos and trials. Um, we've engaged with lots of different vendors and we've actually been used as a test bed for a lot of R&D work for some of our major suppliers. So we've been, we've been very fortunate with that. Um, but we also, uh, we needed to understand our journey. What are we trying to achieve from this? The first steps uh, we needed to take was to understand exactly how are we going to implement Industry 4 within CooperVision. Um, we very quickly realized that uh, this isn't a one man or a one team exercise. So we established a multi-skill team uh, of both external vendors and suppliers, but also internal team members from a ver uh, variety of different disciplines. Uh, we did a review of the technology that we're currently using to understand, well, what can we already utilize and what perhaps is legacy and would require additional work or investment. Um, we reviewed all the different technologies that we'd evaluated to try and uh, better understand which ones we felt would offer value. We also like to identify the opportunities that these different technologies could perhaps um, uh, give us and the benefits that we might realize by using them. Uh, we then decided to summarize all of these into what we, can, what we called industry four cases, essentially smaller, more manageable segments of industry four so that we could better evaluate our options and make a strategy and a plan going forward. So what were those five cases? So, the first one we looked at was material and process analytics. So essentially, this is big data. It's looking at the process, our manufacturing process, our raw materials, um, and all of the uh, manufacturing techniques that we're using to see what we can learn and how we can use the data that's being generated to produce process stability so that we don't get fluctuations in quality or yield or throughput. Once we've got a better understanding of that, we can then exploit that data to actually improve and increase those features. Uh, the next case was to reduce machine downtime. So in simplistic terms, predictive maintenance. Uh, if we know that something's going to go wrong ahead of time, we can better plan for it and we can put actions in place to prevent unscheduled downtime um, and production losses. The third case, uh, and it's quite a biggie in industry at the moment, is energy. Um, every company is, is uh, looking at their energy usage. So we wanted to have a greater understanding of the usage of energy so that we could then better understand opportunities of where we could reduce our energy consumption. Uh, the fourth case uh, was very much focused on the single pane of glass philosophy that we've uh, come across so many times in our journey. We've got many, many systems that are presenting or displaying data from various different sources but we wanted to come up with a solution that allows all of the data that you need to be available to you in a single pane at the time at which you need it. And the fifth case was our use of digital twins. Uh, it's, a, it's a philosophy or a technology that we've actually got experience with, with some very positive outcomes. So we'd like to uh, further exploit and investigate those, uh, those opportunities to see if we could further benefit um, the processes and the production within CooperVision. So our first case uh, was essentially the use of big data. So we're going to be looking at the data that we already have. Uh, and we have a huge amount of data, as a lot of manufacturers do. 
Um, it's all siloed up in various different places, but we've got a vast amount of data. We just don't know what to do with it. Uh, the solution we're looking at will be big data analytics. So how do we analyze the data to learn from it to make uh, intelligent business decisions? How are we going to do that? Which technologies do we look to use for? Uh, Thingworks was, was a clear winner for us. Uh, it was a very powerful platform that offered us a large number of the features and capabilities that we were looking for. Um, but we also recognize that the data sources that will feed into Thingworks are going to come from a huge number of sources, um, most of which we already have in place. We just need to unlock that data so that we can better learn from it. The second case is our predictive maintenance. Fundamentally, we want to reduce machine downtime. By reducing that, you're improving your uptime, you're reducing your CPU, and we can apply more intelligence to our preventative maintenance strategies. So the solution we're going to be using will be uh, predictive maintenance with the use of machine analytics uh, with some AI or machine learning capabilities. The technology or the solution provider we've selected was Sensei. Um, not only were they a very local company to us, so we could engage with them um, on a regular basis, but also they had a very proven track record with a number of huge multinational companies. So uh, we weren't, we didn't feel like we were going to be a guinea pig. It was, it was employing a used and, and proven solution. Our third case for energy usage. Essentially, we, we're very conscious of our, our green or our carbon footprint. So we wanted to better understand our energy usage so that we could then uh, look to reduce it. Uh, we're driving towards becoming a greener CooperVision um, by reducing the energy that we're using, uh, but have a far greater understanding to make sure that we're not wasting or consuming any more than we need to. Uh, this will require a huge amount of energy monitoring, trending. Um, we're going to be re uh, extracting the data from multiple different sources and different plants within the business uh, so that we can then better understand and compare the usage between similar lines or processes. Again, the raw data will be feeding into uh, an analytics platform. Again, Thingworks is our, our platform of choice. Um, but again, we'll also require additional hardware or technology in order to extract some of those energy metrics that we can then use and analyze. Our fourth case is visualization. So it's all about having all of the data available, but at the right time in the right place. So it's very much embracing the industry for single pane of glass philosophy. Uh, we have a huge uh, number of data sources, but we don't need to be looking at them all, all the time. So the ability to develop and build dynamic dashboards um, and have that content delivered to the right person at the right time is key to make uh, a very efficient um, and streamlined operation. Uh, looked at quite a few technology providers for this. Uh, uh, many of which we're already using within the plant. Uh, we just plan to exploit those even more. Uh, we also realized that uh, Thingworks was, again, capable of managing or developing a lot of these single plane of glass applications, uh, certainly at the early pilot stage. Um, and our fifth case, the simulation. So we're looking to uh, put together simulations of processes, of lines, of modules, not only from a machine development and technology development point of view, but also from a manufacturing process point of view. So it would enable us to identify perhaps bottlenecks or high areas of losses or opportunities where we could perhaps improve or increase um, a certain area of a production area and have a better understanding of what that might look like on the, uh, on the larger scale um, for the whole production line. Uh, we'd be looking to employ AR and VR technologies, as well as uh, full line simulation technologies, um, such as uh, Simio or some of the Rockwell Emulate technology. So the deployment strategy, we decided to um, uh, go ahead or go about it in the, in the method of using two pilots. So the initial pilot implementation was going to focus on the first two cases. So our process analytics, which was looking at the big data analytics, and our predictive maintenance case, so looking to reduce downtime. We uh, recognized and identified the partners that we wanted to work with and who we felt would give us the, the results that we wanted um, in a, uh, a reasonable timescale. 
So the critical thing that we needed to achieve uh, in order to get these pilots off to a successful start was to clearly define the scope of what we were looking to achieve. And we did that through a series of workshops. So a large number of us attended the innovation workshop at NDMA, um, where we had representatives from multiple different disciplines throughout the business. And we spent three days sharing our thoughts and our feelings on exactly what we were looking to achieve, what each area of the business required from the Industry 4 solution, and the benefits and advantages that we could realize um, if we get the pilot right. Similarly, with our um, predictive maintenance pilot, we needed to identify a number of assets. Uh, we have tens of thousands of assets uh, in play currently at CooperVision. We needed to start small so that we could uh, get some proof of concepts and prove the technology that we're proposing before we look to scale up. Um, through working closely with the Sensei team, we were able to identify a number of assets, particularly ones that were known or prone to failure, um, as they would, uh, in theory, provide us with the quickest result and the quickest opportunity for a predictive maintenance solution to provide some value uh, back to us. <coughs> we then had to look at our infrastructure. <coughs> um, we recognized that a lot of these technologies, although they're in play or they're in place within the business, they're not currently connected. So we needed to look at the holistic uh, solution. So not only where was the data coming from, that could be as low level as a sensor, or it could be an existing source of data, um, but also where are we going to put it and where do we want to put the results of that data? So we reviewed uh, whether we were to put a solution on-prem, whether we were going to host in the cloud. Um, but we also needed to better understand what we wanted to do with the data that we were going to be producing as a result of those, uh, those pilots. Our final solution uh, for at least the pilot stage was to go for an on-prem solution. It simplified the requirements for our IT infrastructure. It kept everything enclosed within the, uh, the CooperVision space, but the technologies that we've employed are very easy to scale up so we could very quickly deploy from on-prem up to the cloud, which would allow us to scale this up to multiple uh, applications or areas here within the UK, or even to scale up on a global scale to start in involving our plants uh, from other countries. Um, we very quickly recognized that no one person or no one team can achieve this. So we put together a large team, um, each of whom brought their own specialist skill and their own specialist input, and each of whom would be vital for the success of these pilots. Uh, there was, uh, we needed a, a kind of a core team to drive the pilots, but we needed involvement from you know, the, the, the list of people that are, are shown in front of you in order to get the maximum amount of benefit from this. So where are we at the moment? So the current status with our, uh, our big data analytics, our process analytics pilot, we are, we're essentially, we're up and running. So we have our application installed, our infrastructure is all complete. Um, we have live data being mapped in from lines and sensors. We have additional siloed manufacturing data being mapped, uh, ready to be trended and apply some analytics tools to. Um, and we have our user interface, our, our GUI is already up and running uh, line side for the operators to start exploring and navigating around so we can gain some feedback. From the predictive maintenance pilot, we've identified our assets. So we've gone for 20 assets to start with, 15 of which are largely servo motor driven, but we wanted to find five other assets which um, were going to require additional censoring or data sources to enable them so that the output of the pilot was that we had a wide scope of technologies and different platforms that we could then use and scale up and prove that the system worked on a number of different types of asset, not just a servo drive. So we are fully connected. Uh, we have a number of assets that are being, uh, the data is being sent seamlessly from source through the ThingWorks platform, direct up to the Sensei cloud, the results of which are now in the process of being learnt, and we're expecting the, the first prediction results back um, within the next week or two. So where do we go next? What is our vision? Essentially, we want to do more. We've, we've already seen the potential. 
we've recognized that there is a huge amount of value to be gained from this pilot. So we are looking to uh, deploy phase two very, very quickly. Um, we are still in discussions with our senior management team as to whether phase two will be more of the same process. So within the same facility that we've currently got our pilots running, or if they'd like to deploy it to a completely different site to prove that we can get similar benefits from multiple different types of technology, uh, which contain both brand new, but also legacy hardware as well. So uh, phase two, we'll also be looking to uh, review and look at the other cases as well. So the energy monitoring, uh, our simulation, um, and further exploit the single pane of glass technology. So what have we learned so far? Um, it's been a, uh, an 18 month journey so far. So we certainly um, uh, identified a few opportunities where were we to do this again or to advise others. Um, one thing is be realistic with your timescales. It takes a lot longer than you, you think. Um, everything from evaluating the different technologies to gathering the teams together to put together your strategy to actually implementing the infrastructure and the technologies that you choose uh, takes an awful long time. So be prepared for the long journey, not a quick fix. Um, the resourcing side, um, a dedicated resource is more than highly beneficial. I would almost say it's essential to get any meaningful value and results back from the, uh, the implementation. A dedicated resource is, is almost essential to, uh, to realize or maximize the potential that you can achieve. And the third thing is ensuring full engagement. Now, we very quickly recognize that this is more than just a technology shift. Um, it's a cultural shift. So we, uh, we felt it was vital to engage every area of the business to ensure that everyone was fully aware of what we were attempting to do, but also everybody, everybody had their voice. Everyone had their opportunity to share their ideas and their insights because senior management, they know what they know, but they won't know what operators know. Maintenance have got a unique insight into a production area. The engineers know things that no other uh, discipline knows. So we felt it was vital to make sure that we covered every area of the, uh, of the business to make sure we got a full picture of what we were trying to achieve. Thank you very much. That's the uh, end of my presentation. Are there any questions?